Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this place to be able to gather to get today, Lord, and we just pray that you would have our way with us now, Lord, that we would surrender our cares and our worries, Lord, and we'd put our eyes to you, Lord, the creator and the one that can sustain us. Lord, we pray now that you use Pastor Izzy to encourage us, give us this day what we need to be fed, not just, not just in material things, but Lord, in spiritual things. We ask mm-hmm. that now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, guys, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to continue our study that we began there last week, and we saw this beautiful introduction by Paul to the church at Corinth. Now, for those who weren't with us, we just did a little background on the on the place of Corinth, how it was, it, you know, it was a city port in a, in a strategic location. If you if you're familiar with the the Mediterranean region, you know, over there, they actually um, they were one of the ports of commerce, we would say, of the day. I mean, and and they were also Um, historically at that time from what I've been able to find out through studying that they were considered to be like the third largest population of Romans outside of Rome. They had, um, you know, of course Rome being the first but then Philippi was one of the the second greatest uh, Roman colonies and then this place, Corinth, was also just inhabited by a bunch of Romans. Um, Quite a few of them were soldiers, some of them were sailors in the merchants, uh, you know, taking the goods back and forth. Rome, Rome was ruling the world at this time as well as going on. So to get, you know, when you're ruling the world, you gotta, you got to have goods coming and going to the capital. And so um, Corinth was one of the stopovers. Now because of that, Corinth being a, kind of the, the spot where sailors stopped off, it became known in the ancient world as one of the most, um, the Las Vegas of the ancient world is really what we would say today. It was, it was a um, Sin City. Yeah. They were, I mean, if you call someone a Corinthian back then, that was really low blow. That was like you were calling them, you know, you real reprobate, low life. You, you know, you're, you're full out sinning and all that. And, and it was one of those encompassing terms for, you know, you're doing all the sins in the bag, so to speak. So, they, so this is the place we looked at last week, how Paul wrote to this church in this spiritually dark place, and he said, God has begun a work in you, and he is, we saw what it says in Philippians, what's it say? God, he who began a good work is what? Faithful to complete it. So Paul, a little bit more elaborately or, or expanded, last week we saw, he said that God started a work, he is going to perfect the work, he's going to confirm that work that he had begun until the revelation of his son. And he said, and, and he encouraged them. He just opened with this great opening of the letter. And we saw last week that this introduction really shifts the focus as he's writing to this church, not to the problems they had in the church. They, they By the way, they did have problems. You, those of you that have read the book, you know, he has got to address a lot of problems. But we saw last week, before Paul addressed the problems, what did he first do? He pointed them to the problem solver. He said, listen, there's a God that gives us grace, that gives us peace, and I am praying to him, thanking him for for what I hear about you guys, that you have come to faith, that you have, that you are growing in the knowledge of the Lord, and, and that you're, you know, you're, he's just rejoicing as a pastor. Here you guys are in a dark place spiritually, and yet you're letting the light shine. Good job. Keep it up. Now today... We're going to shift from that wonderful introduction to one of these words in the, in the well, we saw verse 9. He ended, we, we got through verse 9 last week. And God is faithful, through whom, he says, you are called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, or some of your translations might say, and however, now I exhort you, brethren. Now his tone changes. Now he says, I'm going to exhort you. Exhort means um, to encourage someone. And some people, I, honestly, there are some people that are not good at exhorting. In fact, they should not do it. 
because they don't do it well. But, but there are some people in this world, you guys might know maybe your grandma was like this or, or there's someone that really loved you and they had this way of helping you get on track with love. I mean, they, an exhortation is really, truly helping a person coming alongside him and saying, hey, you can do it. You know, you can, you can stay on track. You can, you can get on the right track. In fact, exhortation literally means to help correct someone's path to, to give them that encouragement to get on the right track, to go th down the straight and narrow. And it is a beautiful thing when done with love. It is a painful thing when done without it. Now, it might still be right. You might need to get on track, but it hurts when someone comes along that doesn't love you and tells you, you know, hey, s knock it off. You need to straighten up or, you know, and there's no love there. They could be telling you the truth, but it hurts like crazy, you know. I, I want the ones that exhort to be like Paul. See, Paul loved the church there. He loved when he heard the, that they were growing. He loved to hear that God's grace was making these people a light in a dark place. And so, yeah, he's got to deal with a problem, but he does it in love. And we should follow the same example. Now, I'm just breaking this down because I don't know why, but young Christians feel compelled to help exhort all the old Christians. Or any Christian. Even the non-Christians they try to exhort. Which, by the way, don't even bother. Our exhortations are to be to the brethren, and they're supposed to be done in love. And Paul does it in a, in a particular manner that is a great role model for us. Um, when we have the privilege, you should, you should look at it as a privilege. When you get to be used to help in exhort someone else, to help them get on track, you need to follow what he did. First, point them to the one who is doing the work. It's not you. It's God. And he's faithful, Paul said. Do you see that in verse 9? God, highlight that in your Bible. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son. And he says, who is Jesus Christ, our master, our Lord. He says, God is faithful. Teach them the faithfulness of God first before you teach them that they got a problem that they're off tracking. Because once you know God is faithful and he's there for you and he's going to bring you to the end, then whatever it is that you're having trouble with, you feel comfortable with the guy who's there to help you. You know, what's the psalmist say? Uh, if man is against me, um, well, too bad. Who can be against me if God is what? Is for me. I mean... If God is for you, and you know that in your heart, by the way, are ever men against us? I mean, could it be the boss at work, or the neighbor next door, or your co-worker, or a family member? God forbid, but they do sometimes come against us, don't they? Even our own family. And if you don't know God is for you, buried down deep in your heart, you can get really discouraged when others come against you. It can really set you off track. So Paul is, is giving the, to me, that one of, uh, this shows me, now I already know, because Paul didn't write this letter to the Corinthians till his third missionary journey. So by now, Paul has, you know, done previous missionary journeys. He's done a stint at Ephesus where he, he helped plant the church, but he also stayed and pastored it. But he wasn't the sole guy doing the work. God sent in other guys there, you know, and, and there, was, there was the God's spirit at work bringing people to the Lord. And he had a taste of that sweetness, but he had had enough years of seeing God at work to recognize that, well, it's with maturity he's saying these words. There's some things, you know, people have problems with, and... and I mean, you know, we got to focus them on the Lord first. And then the little problems, they kind of are a lot easier to address. So we see him now shifting to the address of a one problem. And I want to show you this problem. Tell me if you think this problem exists at all today. Because this is when the church was pretty new, really. If you think about it, it you know, being written around 60, 60 A.D. Christ died in 33 A.D. So we don't have that old of, you know, we, we don't even have three decades of Christianity yet on the planet. We'd call this fledgling Jesus movement back then, okay? This is the original Jesus people. 
Okay, and they're just starting out. Yet Paul, after th not even three decades have passed of church history, listen to the problem that he, huh, he has to address that was going on at Corinth. He says, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete, the same mind in the same judgment. For I've been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels amongst you. Now, we never have quarrels in Christianity, do we? We never have divisions amongst us. Listen to this, he says. Now, Paul says, I mean this. I hear that, um, well, each one of you is saying, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. He says, has Christ been divided? Paul says, uh, he says, Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He said, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. He says, for I did not come to baptize. He says, and, uh, uh, he says now I did baptize, verse 16, the household of Stephanus, but beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized any other. In verse 17, you might want to highlight this. He says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would be made void. He says, I was sent by God to preach a really simple message of good news. Gospel means good news. You know that, right? Gospel, the word gospel literally means good news. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.